I'll just give you a little bit of uh, background on our first two speakers today. Um, Jane Durbridge, she's currently working on projects for the Women's and Children's Hospital Foundation. She's been there for about two years. Um, what she's been able to bring together here is an interest in social care of women and children whilst developing her skills in online communications including social media, websites and e-newsletters. And she's also going to be talking with Jill Newman today, who also works with her at the Women's and Children's Hospital Foundation. And they've established, oh, she, she's uh, in establishing an arts in health program for the hospital. And uh, Jill is integrating arts into the life of the hospital to improve people's health and wellbeing. Although very interested in the role social media has to play for organisations today, Jill considers her own personal skills in social media pretty low tech. So um, here they are. Thanks, Jane and Jill. Uh, Take it away, thank you. Thanks, Josh. So just to define us, I'm Jane Durbridge and this is Jill Newman, although we do work together in programs and we are sort of a bit interchangeable in the organisation. So the foundation is the official charity for the hospital and we aim to support the hospital by providing the best care through research and education, the best facilities and the best hospital environment. Our staff are approximately 10 full-time equivalents, include fundraising who seek donations through meaningful communications in the community, corporate services who keep us running and keep us paid, and Jill and I actively seek projects and interact with the hospital to support its success. We have traditionally had no opportunity to fundraise for the organisation. So one of the reasons I was interested in coming with Jane today was to acknowledge that in most organisations, you will have people with varying skills and interests and abilities in relation to social media. Personally, I was not engaged in social media. No Twitter, no Facebook, not even a computer at home. Um, but I'm living proof that with influence, guidance and education of one person like Jane, you can convert people and have a big impact on an organisation through the use of social media. So what did Jane do to start us off? The first thing she did was in a team meeting was ask, what are we doing about social media? Um, the answer being nothing <laughs> at that time, um, but it did start the uh, uh, discussion and identified who'd connected, who hadn't, and immediately some of the fears and furfies about it too. Um, so then what Jane did was to do something. She sought permission to start something, basically just putting together a little basic policy and creating an online profile. She then identified the champions and allies in the organisations, people like myself who kind of went, well, I'm really interested in it, but I have no idea about it. Um, also people who were already on it in some way um, and those and how they used it and how they were using it. So Jane started to educate and interest people. Um, she then also reported back. So each time we came to a team meetings, um, which were generally weekly, she again gave us info and education, things like our first retweet from Kelly Noble, which for most of us was like, what's a retweet? At least I knew who Kelly Noble was. <laughs> um, and so she taught us about the importance of that, taught us some of the language that was starting to be used. And so soon we started using some of those things. Um, and also what it then meant to our organisation. As well as that, she has now continued to explore how social media could support others in the organisation. So she's looked at each of the different people and how something might help them. And from that, Jane has gone from zero interest <laughs> to active interaction by the team. Um, so one of the things that Jane did when she first established us was to actually just put together some identified aims for our social media, almost um, as a way of bedding down some of the concerns and stuff that people might have. So for the Women's and Children's Hospital Foundation, our social media aims were to interest new donors in supporting us, raise community awareness about how to assist us, to stimulate conversations about our fundraising events and the projects we were undertaking, and provide an avenue for communities such as the arts, the groups that I was working with, to engage with the health sector. So how's it working? We're not interested in just building a follower base of large amount of numbers. We're, we're building our base with people who are relevant to the hospital. For example, those who are in South Australia or those who are interstate or overseas who have a hospital connection or an interest in our hospital a similar health organisation or a not-for-profit organisation. So our Twitter and Facebook bases move to about the 1500 mark. And these are people who um, are concerned about what we do and are interested in listening about what we do. 
Since starting in social media, we've been so grateful for the response from Adelaide, wider SA and interstate. We've been able to build a community of supporters who care about the hospital in a way that was not available previously, to talk to all ages, demographics, corporate and community, past and present hospital individuals, families and staff, to stimulate conversations about our foundation and social media enables its followers to donate and support us in numerous ways and um, receive donations in kind, financially and in goods from South Australia and beyond. So what I'd like to do now is just give you a few of the examples of the connections that we've made through social media and some that have directly had an impact with me. Um, so we met a woman called Cathy T. She came to us via social media when we were promoting a resource book that we've got, which is called There's No Such Thing as a Silly Question. From there, Cathy has supported us um, with artwork donations from our Mother's May exhibition because she's a photographer. Um, and also twice she's provided us with um, beautiful photographic works that have been sold at our gala dinners as part of our auctions. But more importantly, she talks up the work we do to her contacts and networks. And so she's become a true supporter for us. And from that, we've then gained more contacts and more artists and more other people in her wide range of fields of the people that she connects with. The next one is Moni. Um, so Moni um, also supported the first arts exhibition by providing us with delicious cupcakes um, for our opening art exhibition and then went on to hold a fantastic high tea event at the Highway Inn and the funds raised from that high tea event um, went to the Women's Children's Hospital Foundation to support the hospital direct. So that initial engagement of just looking for a cupcake person to um, and finding money and then has led actually to now a person who actively creates donations for us through her events. Um, one of the other key fundraisers, Sandy, who is pretty low tech like me, um, at the foundation recently put together a charity house at High Marsh Island where everything to do with the house was donated. The land's been donated, the house was provided by System Built, every single piece of uh, the, the fittings and everything inside the house has been donated. But at one point there was difficulty gaining a security system and so she came to Jane and said, do you think somebody out there could help us? And so Jane tweeted and to see if anyone out there could and of course through Twitter it wasn't actually the immediate donation we received but someone else suggesting a contact of someone who we should contact and within a very short time a security system had been donated and from Sandy's point of view Sandy was sold and in her words she said I've now moved over to the dark side <laughs> so welcome to the dark side um, and she now sees the potential of social media and it was actually quite a big moment for Jane and I because she had been up until that time a barrier because she hadn't seen how it could interact with her and the work that she does and it had been actually quite a scary medium for her given that her work is very much about working very closely with a person to make large donations. Um, the final example is one, oh, by the way, the house is currently available for sale. So anybody that's looking for a house in the range of you know, 360 to 400,000, we've got a beautiful rock star house available, so see me after. Um, the final example aims to show how the smallest of things can make a difference. Again, through Twitter, uh, Twitter contact, we received some paper rolls and large cardboard. Um, by providing these to the play therapist, we saw a ward changed. It gained clouds and sun and literally a whole indoor sky. Jane was able to thank the donor via social media with little photos. And now we have an ongoing supply of donated card and paper for the hospital play therapist by this person. Um, so it's continual now. And so that's a huge difference. What else can be done? Just because it's free doesn't mean it should be treated cheaply. So more time for commitment to social media and more of a priority in comms for our organisation. Tips for online conduct, be engaging and build relevant contact, content, be discreet, thoughtful, polite, be professional, be a bit wary, but be persistent and consistent. It's all about relationships. You see yourself up there? <laughs> in fundraising or not for profits, it's all about relationships, not just about the dollars, and in social media the same applies. It's important to foster these relationships, both external to the organisation and internal. Take your team along the ride too. Finally, I'd like to add that our Adelaide social media community has been so supportive and encouraging. I'd like to say thank you and well done to the community leaders. Thank you.
Yep. Um, if anybody has any questions at all, just uh, rifle them off and uh, hopefully uh, these two experts here will be able to answer them for you. Um, fairly organically. I think that's the best description. We we are just adding it in where we can. So when the newsletter came out, it was, you know, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, add it to our signatures. So it just grows by association. There has been one big win that we've had, is that Jane and I, or Jane, with me doing some content for it, um, developed an email newsletter. And so the, the foundation had never done that. So it had never sent email contact to any of its donors. And the foundation has a huge donor database. And so we piloted that project um, based free. on the Arts in Health program for free through a contact that came through social media. Um, and so did an email newsletter to a safe group for the foundation, which was my Arts in Health team, the people that had uh, so people that had been involved in exhibitions, people that had purchased, or not purchased because it's free, people that had sought the book. Mm -hmm. And so we did that as a pilot and kept it really safe for the organisation, for all of those people that were concerned about us having access and sending things via email. Um, just at our last team meeting the other day, we talked about doing our next email newsletter and the comment was made was, well, can we open it up to um, the, the, our database? And both the people that had been the main barriers to that turned around and straight away said, well, I don't see why not. You know, so we, so it was a massive leap for both of us <laughs> going, yes. You actually had a social media campaign before the e-newsletter. Sorry? You actually had a social media campaign before the e-newsletter. Yeah, essentially. But mm. it, it, it kind of grew simply by what little bits Jane was able to try and do. And it was very much about educating the rest of the people. If, if Jane had come into the meeting and said, OK, I'd like us to do a, a social media campaign, do a social media policy and get us up to speed, it would have shut down straight away. Yeah. But it was actually almost that soft approach of going, well, what do we already do? Well, who's on it? What do people do? How do you use it? I mean, I now have a Facebook account. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, um, and things like that. And so it was actually showing people really what it is and how it is and how that sort of happens. Um, so, and and yeah. responding that if there's a risk, you just deal with it honestly and openly and people make mistakes and people can be rude and you just deal with it as, mm. as it happens. It's, it's, not a, it's about being polite and, mm. and open. But the gains and wins that we've had from a fundraising aspect have been huge because we actually sit in a, in a section within the foundation where our role isn't to fundraise at all. Our role is to do integration direct with the hospital for the de delivery or development of pro projects and programs. Um, and so now we've actually got this fundraising role as well where we've been able to go and do 101 in fundraising and learn a bit more about those aspects and um, the organisation feels quite confident in getting Jane to, to do the ask uh, for and lots of things and forever and now, you know, Jane, can we, what do you think about this? How could we get that? Or, so it's been a really big shift. In, in that way. And it's great for us to be able to contribute too. It's great yeah. to be able to bring in paper and money and mm. security systems and because um, we've, we've sort of been the spenders, not the <laughs> providers. So and much. one of the things that's become really um, a learning process is, and this is quite, um, when we were talking about this with the fundraising manager, if she was saying is that everybody actually has the inbuilt philanthropic gene. It's there. People want to give and share. Mm. And what we actually do in the organisation and through these methods is actually allow people to match up what they have at their fingertips with what we need in mm. this hand. And so that the example of the paper is a perfect one. Someone that was actually, you that's a waste product that would normally end up in a waste environment. And now it's got a massive importance in that sort of environment within the hospital of you know an endless supply of paper they, they don't have to be sparing with it they can just use it however they want and need to.